Terry Thorson, you've published your memoir, Phantom in the Sky, A Marine's Backseat View of the Vietnam War. And you spent about six months in uh, South Vietnam, 1969, during the Vietnam War. And you had uh, jobs besides being a, radio, a radar intercept officer, but your main job was to be a radar intercept officer. Just to get us started, can you just tell us what the, what the basics of that job involved? In 1969, uh, Navy and Marine Phantoms were a two-seat, tandem-seat jet, uh, and I might say one of the best of its age. Mm. And the uh, backseat person was labeled a radar intercept officer. Our the duties uh, uh, were not... Uh, as same as the pilot because there were no controls in the back. So we were naval aviators, but we were radar intercept officers. And in that, our principal job or mode of operation was to intercept an enemy plane and direct our pilot in for a kill. That's the radar intercept officer part. Yeah. But we did other things like all the communications and all the navigation and assist the pilot in any other way that we could. And in particular, in that regard, to keep our eyes outside the cockpit or frequently actually, yeah. to make sure that we weren't uh, being focused in on by an enemy plane or for safety purposes if we were. In particular, yeah. at that time in, in South Vietnam, there was a lot of air work, a lot of air aviation. You mean so that anti was the job? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You mean anti-aircraft coming in that you're that you're looking out for too, or? Well, in in uh, in South Vietnam at that time, um, because of our buildup in the war there was a lot of aviation activity. Oh, I see what you're saying. So just look at the mainly us. Yeah, yeah uh, enemy aircraft might come in. And of course, we were vigilant to look for those. Yeah. But the main thing was to prevent any mid-airs with a friendly aircraft. Yeah, and you, you know, just even what you, what you said, uh, just in your introductory, your first comments, a number of things came to mind. Um, I think I remember that you described, you described, you know, the various scenes that you see. I mean, one of the things you described is the flak. I don't think you used that word, but that's a word from World War II. You know, the flak that you can see coming from anti-aircraft uh, uh, weaponry down below. But I, I think there's another scene you described where you can see the ground soldiers down there or the Marines. You can see the guys on the ground fighting. That's sort of that's the lowest layer, and then there's the next layer where you can see the helos operating, and you can see what they're doing, and you're above that, and you you can you're just witnessing this incredible scene uh, beneath you. Do I have that right? I mean, you 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 know, this is one of the things you got to see up where you were in this jet. Yes, uh, we had uh, a very high uh, altitude to take in a, a lot of the, the ground. Uh, visibility. Uh, let me back up on one thing real quick yeah. as far as duties in the back seat. Yeah. The other uh, peripheral things that we did, uh, and they were important, uh, the role of the radar intercept officer being that uh, it is descriptive to be the one to uh, act, acquire and then uh, direct the pilot in to kill an enemy aircraft. In the Marines in particular, uh, we weren't misused, but we were heavily used mm -hmm. uh, to an air to ground work. So yeah. uh, one of the other things about our duties was to maintain the pilot, uh, just take everything off of him, and he could focus on his sight picture. So we would uh, keep him apprised of the airspeed and altitude and uh, let him know when we reached the pickle altitude all of that. So most of our, well, I'd say about 60% of our missions were air to ground work for ground forces and not just Marines, but Army and Arvin and 
et cetera. So that's other duties. Uh, yes, when we, uh, one of my first missions, uh, it was a very much an eye opener. Uh, we were uh, told to hold high and wait our turn to go in on the target. And uh, it was a recon team on top of a hill. And you could actually see the muzzle flashes wow. of the enemy and the friendlies going back and forth. Wow. Yeah. So we were up at uh, about maybe 12,000 feet, and uh, so it's a little over two miles up. But still, you could clearly see it, and it was uh, kind of surreal. It just, just uh, was a that particular one was pretty intense. And, uh, wow. Uh, the enemy we thought was going to overrun our forces. They were lucky to get out. Yeah. And is it is this the same? Uh, incident where you can also see the helos operating at the at the same time, sort of uh, you know below where you are. Yes, yes. Um, on that particular one, the uh, observer plane was a an OV-10, and OV-10s are, are highly loaded with armament. The phosphorus uh, to mark targets and stuff like that. So, yeah. During that particular mission, um, the helicopter that was going to extract the recon team was down low in the valley away from the fighting. He was just waiting. You could see him just covering it. Wow. And to wow. reduce the amount of fire and prepare to bring that helicopter in to rescue them, the OB-10 and the Huey Cobra, which is a phenomenal little jet with very good firepower. Uh, the two of them worked over the target, and reduced yeah. the uh, the enemy fire, and uh, make them get their heads down so that the helicopter could swoop in. But uh, it was uh, it was very. I was in my first week there, first few missions, and just very much uh, a tent. I opened and I felt for the ones on the ground because I, I wasn't sure they were going to get out. Wow. Yeah. 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 And I mean, those, is, uh, if you flew well over a hundred, um, I think, I don't know if the right word is missions. Is it like 123 or something, if I remember correctly? That I number? flew 123. Yeah. We called sorties. Sorties, uh, right. Missions. Um, yeah. And um, they were flights, basically. You know, so we called them sorties. Right. And they, they had a, a variety of different kinds. Right. But the one you just described, I mean, you, you mentioned a number of memorable sorties, but I, I imagine this is one of, the most, one of the most memorable. Because it was uh, one of the very first ones. Yeah. Uh, it, it was indelibly. Yeah. Yeah, in my mind, it it stayed a long time, and a few others did too. Sure, uh, not all of them were intense, uh, right. like that, but uh, this one was. It was uh, one of those first impression things. Yeah, I can imagine. Now, you you um you said that you know a, a major part of the of the um the radar intercept officers' work is to you know, uh, help the pilot to zero in on an enemy aircraft. Um, you mentioned MiGs a, a couple times. I don't recall, though, that you ever really got into a a toe-to-toe -to -toe with a MiG. Um, to, and, but that leads, in my mind, to the question, and please feel free to respond to this anyway. I mean, did the NVA really have much of an Air Force? Were MiGs ever really really much of a problem. You just don't hear about them. Um, but maybe that's because I primarily talk to infantry guys. Um, to, to what extent were MiGs really uh, an issue? Well, they were there. Um, they were always a threat. They uh, were subdued. Uh, if, think about the time frame. We're talking 69. 69. So, yeah. Uh, the Tet Offensive had already happened the previous year. Right. There were some that. 
we had uh, through our air superiority and we did have that uh, we made some uh, shoot downs of MIG and so they weren't really interested in taking us on yeah yeah because they didn't have uh, very good results at that time earlier on years before uh, they did pretty well with the MIG 15s and 17s yeah 19s came along in there somewhere but the Phantom eventually uh, exhibited its uh, full potential. Yeah. We, we, so we had so many planes, they, they didn't they didn't really come up after it. So yeah. I won't say that the, the RIOs in the Marine Corps were misused in air-to-ground work. What I would say is we were trained to intercept and shoot down MIG if they came at us or if we were directed to. Yeah, we just directed. Uh, I had one good friend who did make a, a contact and did pursue it and requested uh, the permission to fire, and they wouldn't give it. Is that the one that was actually heading and headed to China? Yes. Yeah. So was it was it assumed among among um, the pilots and the and the uh, and the RIOs that? Um, that the Chinese and the Russians, of course, they're they're supporting the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong anyway. But did was it assumed that they played a pretty significant role in the NVA Air Force? You know, to the extent that the NVA had an Air Force in terms of training and, and things like that. I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, I'm I'm not a historian on that. Sure. Um, I I would initially say yes. Um, a lot of, of it was Chinese. Uh, certainly, they were very close, and, and the uh, the planes, the Russian planes, etc., were being supported. Yeah, but uh, we used to actually, when we did a, a, the barrier uh, continuous air patrol out of the Gulf of Tonkin, we'd be able to see the the MiGs taking off and landing about halfway between the DMZ and Hanoi and Haiphong. Uh, but they wouldn't come after us. They, and you weren't allowed to and you weren't allowed to go after them. We weren't directed to go after them. I will I won't say we weren't allowed, but remember also again, time frame wise, we're talking mm. about the curtailment of bombing up north. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Vietnamization. And that was the, yeah. yeah, Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. Well, that, so, um, there is that one incident that you mentioned where you're up in the DMZ, and um, I forget exactly how it goes, but, um, I, so I forget exactly what it is. It's, it's near the end of the section of the memoir where you're, you know, you're just about ready to head off to Japan, or you're going to be heading off to Japan pretty soon. And there is, you go after something in the DMZ area, but then I, if I remember right, you tell the pilot, you know, I think we're in the DMZ or something like that, and uh, we shouldn't be doing this. And I, I won't repeat his exact words, but it's something like, I don't care. And which gave me the impression, <laughs> gave me the impression there were, that there were some rules of engagement in place. Um, let me put it this way. I, I hear from a number of vets that, that uh, you know, Fighters in in Vietnam sometimes felt that their hands were tied by the rules of engagement. Did did you feel that way? I'm thinking of this particular incident that you described, where you're up in the DMZ. But did did you feel that way that the rules of engagement actually worked against the American war effort? Uh, very often they they did so. Yes, uh, yeah. you you would uh, you'd be requested to hit this target over here. Yet maybe activity or enemy fires coming from somewhere else, and you're not given that target. Uh, I I don't know how often that happened. In this one case, we we were right at the, the demilitarized zone, and we were on a target where there was uh, enemy activity, and we subdued that with our firepower, and. Um, we always had uh, uh, some Sunni rockets, uh, just a couple of packs, etc. 
So if we had uh, used our ordinance, the rest of the stores, either napalm, or fragmentary bombs, or rockets, we might have used all those, but we still had some tuning problems. So uh, the, the one that you're talking about here, the, the pilot uh, probably used a couple of curse words and pointed the plane in that direction and went over and hit them anyway. Yeah, and uh, what would normally happen on one of those incidents is there would be a secret code word come up on the guard channel that said "board violation," and it just turned out to be that they uh, it was us. Now I didn't tell the pilot not to go there. Yeah, uh, and I don't have any controls, so if he goes there, I'm right behind him. Yeah. So. Um, I was happy to hit them because they were, uh, well, using the DMZ as a neutral zone or a safe zone to conduct their operation. Sure. Yeah. So uh, to me, they were a viable target. Yeah. Yeah. But we, were, we would only we would only hit anyone else who, um, with a controller. We we always had an airborne controller that had uh, a vision, uh, always had their eye on the friendly, so that we would never bomb our own people. Yeah. Because we couldn't tell from our altitude which was friendly and which was not. Yeah. Well, that that, that leads actually to a, another question I have. There is one um, you mentioned uh, just briefly, um, that you know, you've, got, you've got these situations where the enemy and the friendlies are very close. And there is a, and there is, you know, just a, a phrase that you have at the end of a sentence, or maybe it's just a complete but very short sentence. And you say, "I prayed all my kills were enemy." Um, uh, of course, there were some incidents. I mean, I know a vet who was at Dacto, uh, Hill eight seven five in sixty seven, and and you know the air guys came in and did the best they could, but the NVA and our and our army guys were so close. Some of the army guys were, were were killed by the U.S. ordinance. What was the was there a set policy about that? Like, the reason I'm asking is um, that you describe in your book, you know, day after day after day after day after day, you're going on one sortie after another, and some some days multiple sorties in a single day. If something like that happened, would the pilot even be informed? Because you know you don't the pilot needs to be psychologically ready to go for the next mission. So do, do you get what I'm saying? I mean, if if there was a a friendly fire incident, just to use that, would the would the pilot even know about that? Um, if it was just one of those situations where these guys were really in close, they said, "Look, just hit them." Because if you don't hit them, we're going to get overrun. So that's that's the choice. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, how how what was the what was the how would that be dealt with? Well, uh, let me take a, a roundabout way to answer the question. Okay. Again, uh, we assumed from whether we were scheduled for it or whether it ended up being an emergency flight, uh, that uh, situations on the ground would dictate what they wanted or what we needed to do. Yeah. Uh, we never did anything in the dark, so to speak. Uh, we always had a, an airborne controller, so that I'm aware of, we never hit our group. I, I think as the war developed and our technology developed with it and our approach and our uh, action uh, were refined and uh, kept on getting better, uh, that uh, any friendly uh, hits were very much minimized. Yeah. Uh, I think it probably ended up being more artillery that oh, was yeah. more than, than aviation. Sure. Uh, that being said, um, we we approached all of them the same with, with, the, with all of our training uh, in us and with all of our expertise and with all of our uh, well wishes for ground troops, with all of our heart, uh, did the best we could 
with the situation on the ground. And our assist was the observer or observers even on the ground or embedded. Sometimes they were embedded with the unit. Yeah. Um, we weren't going to prevent casualties. We were uh, there to help uh, eliminate an enemy and prevent some casualties. Right. But, but uh, minimize them. But when they engaged with the enemy, if the enemy was close, the kind of munitions that we had is going to be limited on how much you can use without affecting the friendlies. So again, um, I'm not aware of this one that you're talking about. Right, yeah. It was earlier before I, I was there. Yeah. But um, if the outcome was going to be bad either way, um, that's a tough call. That's somebody else's call. Yeah. The one uh, mission that I did have was uh, where the friendlies were 30 meters, mm. just a uh, fragmentary bombs or you know, out of question. But we did have a machine gun. Yeah. And yeah. so we were able to direct that in. And then we also, enemy doesn't know, we would come in over their heads at 50 feet. I mean, just right over. They don't know we aren't shooting. So they put their uh -huh. heads down. So that particular one, uh, we actually became the target for one. And uh, then our ground forces were able to gain the advantage. Yeah, because wow. yeah, you, you described that. You kind of, for lack of, I don't know the right word, but you sort of buzz the enemy and maybe right. stop them in their tracks for a few seconds and give our guys a little time to back up and regroup maybe. Right. Or, or uh, be more active in their fire and push the enemy back. Yeah, yeah. We had more than uh, one incident with that. And, uh, yeah. Again, those are, uh, you go by what's what's on the ground. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're not um, privy to what's there unless they're talking to us via the radio. And sometimes they were. Yeah. So we just did the best we could. And sure. Or put us, have to put down or ordinance wherever we could. Oh yeah, and you know, I, you, you talk to the guys on the ground, read their memoirs, and uh, they talk about you guys all the time. I mean, how you know, how important it was. I mean, they've got the naval fire support, the helos can come in and puff the magic dragon and all that stuff, but they, they talk right. about you guys too, and uh, and how important that was. Did you, um, did you ever, did you work closely with Arvin Air Force at all? I know there's sometimes Arvin ground troops that you're supporting. Did you work at all with the Arvin Air Force, with the Army of the Republic of Vietnam Air Force at all? No. Uh, we were uh, at Chu Lai, um, and Chu Lai existed because Da Nang was full. You just right. couldn't get anywhere in there. So we called it Fighter Town, but, you know, it was also an Army base. It was Joint Army. Arvin was there. We never met them. Oh. If I saw some, they might have been in the exchange. There was a large army hospital there. Yeah. Uh, but it was mainly uh, jet squadrons, although there were some base sixes and others. And there was a whole side of the base that I wasn't familiar with. Oh, okay. We, yeah. had, we had our, our area, we uh, had our hangars, our flight lines. From our brief to the maintenance to the flight line up in our mission and then come back right. to the reverse of that. Right. So didn't uh, didn't very often uh, come in contact with them. I, I did see uh, some of the uh, our AmeriCal uh, Army guys, and they were the ones that protected our base. Um, and when I saw them, I, I felt sorry for them. They always looked rough <laughs> you mean the, the ground troops that came in yeah and they were they were uh shopping in the exchange or something sure they just uh, worn out tired oh the, uh, right yeah uh, just a mess 
Right. Yeah. In addition to being out in the field, you know, the leeches and the relentless heat and humidity and all that. I was thinking about it. I mean, it, it must have been, there must have been something surreal. And you know, we've already used that word when, you know, you're sort of have this God's eye view of this battle unfolding beneath you. Um, it, it must have been surreal as well, though, to go out on a bombing run to, or, you know, close air support. You're in the thick of the fight. You've got ground fire coming up at you. Um, and then an hour later, you know, you're at the officer's club or something like that. It's just, I mean, just sort of jumping from one world to another. Um, that, that must have been surreal in its own way. Just, does that, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but that, that must have been kind of crazy in its own, in its own way. Um, yes. Uh, you, you manage it uh, individually. Um, you're doing your job and you're focused on that. You don't ever uh, consider enemy fire unless you see it. But you can't be distracted by it. Um, so you, you, you keep your head in the cockpit uh, if that's where you need to be. Yeah. And you just keep going. Uh, you let off steam at the club. Uh, everybody is ready to get back to the club, but then the next day you're back up in the air. When and so you, you manage that by uh, whatever self-defense mechanism you have. Sure. Uh, sometimes I played the guitar, sometimes I read, sometimes yeah. the floor show, uh, especially if there's a comedian, kind of kind of helped out. But, yeah, you mentioned, uh, the, you mentioned the Korean bands, and the one time there's the, I think the American female comedian, and, and you mentioned the, the different the different groups that, that come through. When, when you go to the club after a sortie, do you talk about the sorties, or do you just talk about other things? I mean, are, are there, is, is, you know, I mean, is, is that part of the, the way of dealing with it, talking about it, or, or actually not talking about it when you're in the club afterwards? Depends on the, the sortie. Um, if it were a particular, you know, particular hairy one, uh, I probably would talk about it. Say, well, yeah. You won't have, I'm going to guess what happened to me today. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but the truth is that every pilot, every backseat guy, every radar intercept officer has his own story to tell. Uh, his missions are different than mine. Yeah. I mentioned a couple of them in there that, that didn't put theirs in pa on paper, but be the second plane in and drop your ordnance and a secondary explosion go off, and blow holes in the bottom of your plane where you got to triple back on one engine. Yeah. I didn't have that. One of my peers did. Uh, so we were all subject to the same thing. Yeah. You, it's a stress level, obviously. Uh, we all dealt with the stress and trauma. Some, some did it with alcohol. I mentioned that in the book. Um, yeah. I'm particularly fond of that, especially for a pilot. But um, yeah. The end result was that we, we did a lot of good for a lot of folks. And, uh, that was evidenced with me once. Uh, I was in a shopping center uh, up in Arlington. And I was coming out of a store, and a guy had just finished putting a note on my windshield one for the car. And it was, uh, I have a, a, a phantom uh, license plate on my car. He, his note was, uh, thank you. He said, uh, every time we called for you, and there were many, you came and did for us and probably saved us. Yeah. So apparently he was on the ground and, and was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So every once in a while, you, you, you somebody gives you. Thanks, just out of clear blue. But uh, going back to the pilot or I and knowing what we did on the ground, we would get a daily intelligence briefing. Right. And it would summarize uh, our, our efforts, uh, how much we were able to 
Oh, bomb damage assessment, et cetera. Right. And we would know. Um, uh, we would also know right away, say right away, sometime after the flight, probably the next day, if we were any friendlies that were, were killed. And I, for us, our, I, never, I never heard it. Never heard about that. So, you know, I mean, you, you're getting these reports, um, you, there's a, you know, I mean, you, there, there's really no ambiguity. I mean, you can see it, you know, you, you can see this from the air, the enemies there, the, the NBA, the VC are there, our guys are here. You mentioned it several times in your, in your memoir, you know, we did a run and, uh, and, you know, there was less, there was less anti-aircraft after that. I mean, so, I mean, you, you could, a lot right. You could see the results immediately. Um, something else that I, I picked up in your memoir, though, is that um, a, a sense of disillusionment with with the war. Um, I thought I had a oh, I mean, I, you know, one of the quotes I just wrote down. I think it's in a letter you wrote home. You used the phrase "exercise in futility," and I, I'm interested in this because. Um, it seems kind of complicated. Um, on the one hand, there's a sense of pride in what you're doing. Certainly there's a sense that what I'm doing is making a difference for the troops on the ground. At the same time, you know, that phrase, an exercise in, in futility, and, and it comes up several times in your, in your memoir, just to sense that this, this project in South Vietnam just doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm just, I'm just interested in, in hearing your, your reflections on, on that, just kind of that mix of feelings. We're helping the guys on the ground. I'm, I'm proud of what I'm, I'm proud of that I'm responding, you know, to this mission that I have, but also there's a feeling that this thing in South Vietnam just doesn't make very much sense. Well, there's two aspects to that. Yeah. What I felt at the time and then what I felt later. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, it's hard to separate the two. Uh, I'll do what I can. Sure. But in writing the memoir many years later, there's a mix of what went on stateside that I wasn't aware of at the time I became aware of, like LBJ's statement, they can't bomb an outhouse without my say something. Yeah. How pathetic is that for a rule of engagement? Yeah. So, uh, going back to while I was there, uh, I felt like we were doing a good job of what we were doing. Was the end result good? That was tough to ascertain. You, you couldn't sense that uh, when you go out on the same mission to the same location with the mm -hmm. same enemy this day, that day, two days later, three days later. Yeah. I, you know, it's hard to recognize any progress. Mm. We, we know we had uh, effective ordinance. We know that we did eliminate lots of uh, anti-aircraft artillery and other munitions. But was it having a strong or a major influence on overall victory? That couldn't be found, not on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I uh, some of my thought process, put it all in the book, of course, but it, uh, it was depressing. That, that part was depressing. Here you are over your stress, we'll be doing uh, something that you think is so good for somebody. Yeah, yeah. And then you feel like, well, you know, here we are again, and, uh, really have the accomplishment. Yeah. Is, is so, part of, I'm sorry, yeah. is, is part of this, you, you, you mentioned, I, I think it's also in a letter, um, it's just, and it's just a, a, a something that's mentioned quickly in passing. I, I have two things in my mind. One is a sense of, uh, again, I think it's, a, it's, it's in a letter that you include in the memoir, where you uh, express um, if disillusionment's the right word or disappointment with the government of South Vietnam. So a sense of exasperation with the government of South Vietnam. And then there's also this incident you described, which I've heard the same thing from other vets, where the barber by day 
is the Viet Cong by night. So the guy who's on the base, you know, cutting hair for the American personnel uh, by day is a Viet Cong by night. From his perspective, that makes sense. I'm making money and I'm keeping the VC off my back, right? Or something like that. Yeah. From, from the American point of view, this is hard to swallow. Um, are, are those, you know, the, this, this case of the barber who actually turns out to be VC and your reference to the government of South Vietnam, which I think everyone would have to agree is a, a pretty, a mess, right? Is that is that does that figure into your thinking too? That that just the allies we have uh, just don't seem like the best allies. Well, keep in mind, I'm one little facet of the whole effort. Yeah, you know, military effort. Sure. So, with that in in mind, I not I don't have the whole picture. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm also not at a level of uh, determining viable targets. I just go to those targets when they're assigned to me. Right, right, right. So uh, th with that in mind, um, there's some frustration. You know, when, when things don't seem to get any better, victory's not in sight, um, yeah. what are we doing here kind of thing. Um, yeah. I, I, I only speak to the uh, government and, and there's some disorganization. There's some uh, typically, you know, like uh, many other countries, yeah, you know. or civil war. There are a couple of civil wars going on there with Laos and Cambodia at the same time. Right, yeah. So you don't necessarily know who you're, you're dealing with, but are are they really after a victory or are they just sucking up some government funds and other things uh, you yeah. know uh, it, it's it's a it's a question that uh, i think has kind of been answered and mm. uh, there is frustration with their upper echelon yeah uh, with their uh, war effort, which right. you, when you go to war, you need to be committed. Right. Uh, yeah. And I don't think uh, for a lot of them, their heart was in it. And and look at their history. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we we uh, I think it was unfortunate that we would in one way uh, fight with one hand behind our back. Mm -hmm. and that that's the way, the way I put it. Yeah. What well, did I did I understand? I. I you said something early on that I want to return to because I'm um, just to clarify in my, in my own mind. Let's say you've been sent out, you've been given orders, and you have a specific mission. Just here's just a scenario. On the way, you are able to visualize. You can see that we've got NBA moving through a certain area, and however we know this, we know that they're NBA. Um, are you allowed to use your discretion to hit them, or do you have to call in for permission first to uh, to hit the NVA that you've identified as NVA? Well, let's go back to uh, the uh, flight schedule for the day. We yeah. already have a flight schedule that has our missions or sorties uh, outlined. Those can change. Um, those can change in a minute. And you'd be directed to another one. We were always under direction. So no, we never had the uh, freedom uh, to change our mission or to select something else just because we may have seen something. Which, you know, again, we used, uh, we were always under control. Yeah. So the observers, the, which are observer plane, um, and uh, and we did lose some because they fly pretty low and pretty slow. They are in control of what we do, so they could change. It. And so, let's say that you've got an enemy advancing from one area, and they're confronting our friendly forces. Uh, and all of a sudden, someone else approaches them on the flank. Um, the controller might instantly uh, change his uh, approach, 
and say, uh, I'm going to throw down a new mark, which is what we call it, which would be a phosphorus flare. Yeah. Uh, to mark the target. And now I hit my target. So we, we were always under control in that sense. Did he change uh, based on uh, aspects of the battle on the ground? Yeah. Frequently. Okay. So so there was some there was some some discretion. Would would that would the would the observer would the observer have to get permission from someone else to say, look, I mean, I you know, there's something else that we've seen and I think we should hit it, but would that would the observer have then have to get permission or did the observer have in most cases have discretion? I would say they have discretion okay. for what's in front of them. Now, again, I'm not a trained observer. Yeah. Never sure. fly an observer plane. Right. Never flew a mission without being under control of an observer. So uh, yeah. I, they do have discretion for what's what's in front of them. What's in front of them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and it does change. I mean, every, every battle starts out uh, with an objective. Yeah, and, uh, two forces, and then things start to start to change. Sure. Well, I just have a have a, a few more questions here. You you mentioned that um, a lot of your sorties involves uh, close air support. Uh, you also uh, mentioned a number of times the Steel Tiger, uh, the sorties related to um, Steel Tiger. Um, can you tell us what 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 was that? What was Steel Tiger? Well, Steel Tiger, uh, until Newsweek wrote, broke an article on it, was a secret mission using secret, secret weapons. Yeah. You yeah. weren't the only ones doing them. Uh, I recently read a book by an Air Force pilot, a Phantom pilot, who was uh, flying out of Thailand into mostly Cambodia, Laos, and which you would get up really close to the border with South Vietnam. And uh, so they did a lot of them too. I think I had a total of 16 Steel Tiger missions. Steel Tiger is actually, you know, the prominence of the Tiger as far as Southeast Asia. And, yeah. Uh, it's just part of their culture. It actually refers to an area. It's an area where Laos and Cambodia, Cambodia and South Vietnam kind of come together. Yeah, yeah. So it's also the Ho Chi Minh Trail that comes through there that's supplying all the enemy. Right. With missions and supplies. So we would uh, have our missions wherever the enemy was. So that that's where the anti-aircraft artillery was to try to shoot us out of the sky and prevent us from mm. getting their friend, uh, our enemy. Yeah. So that particular area uh, was very built up with AAA. And uh, our missions would be mostly at night. We would uh, deploy secret weapons and uh, we would uh, hit um, the way they work is they put the AAA just into their country, but then they'd shoot across the border and to South Vietnam, where we were, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. trying to help our, our friendly, our forces. So uh, they were a little scary because they were at night. You uh, didn't get real scared till air bursts started getting kind of close to you. You described that. Yeah, uh, but uh, the secret weapons—you um, can talk about them now. They're, they're still used in some of them that, that I know of, and that is they were cluster bomb units and mm -hmm. rocket. And um, um, so it was—it was kind of exciting to have a flight like that using a secret flight, a secret weapon. But when it uh, yeah. published in the Newsweek magazine and. There it was, Steel Tiger mission, what they were. I had done what I'm supposed to do, uh, and not divulge any secrets. And I just, after that, wrote home to my dad about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, <It's> there. <coughs> here's one of the things that we're doing. And yeah. uh, now that somebody's spilled the beans, yeah. I can tell you. 
It, it was secret, I'm presuming, because it involved bombing in Laos and Cambodia on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The, Part of it, and secret weapons. Yeah, and secret weapons, yeah. And I wonder if this is part of the, if this feeds into the sense of, um, you know, the, the exercise in futility, because I've heard multiple times, you know, we'd bomb the mess out of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and the next day, <laughs> you know, they're, they're rolling their bicycles and their trucks, you know, down that thing. It seemed that no matter how much got dropped on that trail, they just would patch it up and, and keep rolling. Well, China was an endless supply. Yeah, yeah. For personnel and munitions and stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> and we know, you know, Russia is involved there too. But right. what happened was when Lyndon Johnson said, we're not going to bomb up north anymore, then they moved all kinds of numbers of anti-aircraft artillery equipment down there where, where we were. So that added, you know, that much more. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. was... Uh, but they lost a lot of planes. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't one of them. Uh, yeah. Getting over to this other guy's book, uh, for a second, the Air Force guy, he had a lot of those. And during the time that it was classified as a secret, still, yeah. he technically wasn't even flying those planes. So periodically, within a month, in order to earn his flight pay, he'd have to take a sortie inside of Vietnam. Oh, okay. Log it in his logbook. Oh, yeah. To, to receive his flight pay, which I is, see. I mean, that's a government thing. Just crazy stuff, yeah. He was the one flying out of Thailand. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, at uh, Udorn, I think. Ud Udorn, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, speaking of secrets, just, just a couple more, more questions here. But speaking of secrets, presumably um, Hanoi Hanna wasn't supposed to know when uh, you and your crew were arriving uh, in Chulai, but apparently she did. Uh, you tell that you tell that story that Hanoi Hanoi Hannah basically greeted y'all when when you arrived. Is is that right? Yep. Welcome aboard, Red Devils. And then she <laughs> said, "We're rocking it tonight. <laughs> we're gonna rock. We're gonna rocket you tonight." And and that ended up happening, right? Yes, it did. So your your first night in Vietnam involved rockets coming in. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that um, if that's how your first, your first day goes, you, you must have had the thought, wow, it's going to be, a, you don't, I don't think you know at that point it's going to be six months, but um, uh, you must have thought, um, if this is what the first day is like, this is going to be a long, a long trek. That was the thought. It was actually longer than that. Uh, at that time, the Marine Corps was still doing 13 months to 13 it. months, yeah. That's well, right. so while I was there, they shortened it to 12. And yeah. then our squadron got pulled out because we had the J model of the Phantom. We went with our sister squadron. Yeah, right. so I lucked out on both those things. Yeah. So you went to Japan, and then you're involved in the, because there's the whole, as you mentioned in your memoir, the whole North Korea thing, there'd been an, uh, an incident right around the time of the Tet Offensive uh, with North Korea, and so you're involved then in that, just sort of keeping eyes on North Korea, just in case there's a problem, there's a problem there. Well, yeah, we assisted the Air Force in a, a five-minute uh, alert for a deterrent to North Korean aggression. Yeah. There was one other one besides of Pueblo. They shot down our that's right. Ones. That's right. Yeah. Honest. And, and you, uh, yeah, that was that was sad because they have no defense, mm. and they're in international waters. It's clearly an act of war. But yeah, and and you 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 express some frustration in the memoir um, because it seemed like the government's response to what very much looked like an, an act of war was not much or seemingly nothing um, doesn't seem to be any retaliation which has had numerous uh, happened numerous times since then too but other things yeah yeah well as we as we wrap up um, first of all i'm curious you know um your memoir is published in 2019 um so 50 years you know 50 years after the after the fact what was it that, that made you, you know, 
pull the story together um, and then to make it available to others. Let me just say, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad you did. Um, as you know, there are a lot of vets who, you know, who won't talk about it, let alone, you know, make things uh, available to others. What was it that, that motivated you to put your story down and to make it available to others? Numerous things. Um, the uh, it's true. Uh, a lot of vets have come home and had issues. Yeah. And uh, they began as soon as they set foot on our soil and weren't thanked for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, when they did the Vietnam Memorial and other programs, many, many, many years later, and, and some of them were having issues with PTSD. Right. Uh, then hadn't been identified. And Agent Orange and others, and they just felt abandoned. Felt sorry for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I didn't come home with any issues. Uh, my uh, my personal thing, which you remember from the book, was my ex-wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But that that's beside the point. Um, mm -hmm. So getting back to your your question. I, I, it's a unique story, uh, mine is, because they get air sick. Mm, yeah. The very first and only one for the oldest and most decorated squadron in the Marine Corps, the Red Devil, the mm. MFA. Uh, it's the first book uh, memoir uh, published by anyone that's been written by an aviator other than the pilot. Hmm. Well, those things make it unique. Sure. Uh, and that's just the, uh, it's, I always thought it was a good story. So I started writing it over 30 years ago. Wow. And uh, had to wait till I retired 10 years ago to really get into it, get it in manuscript form, and then reject it to reject. And years later, here we are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's unique. It's different. It's, it fills a void. A lot of people don't know top gun who goose is what what does goose do mm. uh, so mm. there it is that's what we do yeah we well, were an integral part of it and we really did a lot of good um we just weren't you know the pilot right yeah well it's been a i, I you're the um the fourth uh, author with the university of north texas press um, that I've spoken with and, and um, who've written Vietnam-related memoirs. And one was a Donut Dolly, the other was an Army guy who just saw a lot of intense face-to-face -face combat in uh, the Central Highlands. The other was a Medical Service Corps officer. And then there's you. And, you know, I've been interviewing veterans for 20 years, but it's been so interesting in such a short period of time to read these very different memoirs and to really get a feel for just the incredible variety of experiences in this in this in this war. Last last question: As you look back to as you look back on Vietnam now, um, what does all that mean to you now? Or that's one question. Here's here's another question. It kind of take your pick how you go at it. Suppose I put you in front of a classroom of mine and said, you've got, you know, two minutes to tell these young people, uh, none of whom actually have a living memory of 9-11, by the way, which is hard to believe. Right? Yeah. Um, so Vietnam is, you know, like the Middle Ages or something. But you've got like two, two minutes to tell these young folks what you think they should know about the conflict in, in Vietnam. Um, what... What comes to mind? Well, one thing in particular is I would uh, ask or want two things from our elected officials, legislature, etc. One is to always maintain a well-equipped and trained military. Uh, such that we can uh, engage and defeat any foe anywhere. Mm. That's one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and and the other one is a message to our populace. Again, you've mentioned your you know youth students. A lot of them don't even remember 9/11. Yeah. I would uh, love to see a greater proliferation, really, of uh, patriotism that mm. seems to be lacking today. Mm. Mm. Um, I think those two things uh, would then kind of direct what we do in terms of uh, our homeland security, our uh, support for whomever with whatever force, um, uh, the exercise in futility for Vietnam probably was predestined in, in a way just because of the area, the people, uh, the enemy that really wasn't Vietnamese so much as the support from the big guys, China, Russia. Yeah, yeah. He ended up really kind of fighting them, but, um, I, I see um, a change in, in some people. Uh, they welcome home, military now, sure. better with them. They know they did wrong, some of the ones that have been around quite a while. Um, I would never hesitate to fight for this country if it were necessary. That's the, the key. Is this a necessary war? Mm. And I, I think uh, a lot of our Vietnam vets have struggled with that for years. Um, it, for me, uh, like I say in the book, my satisfaction was supporting our troops to the yeah. best of my ability. Yeah, yeah. I have a positive effect. That's on them well not, not and, how much else, yeah not much else was positive to me yeah well i understand that but the the fellow who um who left the note on your on your windshield though is is evidence right that uh that, yeah. that what you did um made a made a big difference for a lot of guys on the ground and in dallas and in all around the country there there are people walking around veterans walking around right now who might not have been walking around who might not be walking around had, had you and the, and the other uh, air crews you worked with been there to help them out when they're in some tough spots? Exactly. I have a good friend uh, lives not far from me who has a brother who was there, wounded and came home. And we were at a barbecue at his place. He came up and said, thanks, you saved my butt. So, putting it nicer terms. <laughs> yeah, family friendly. So, so uh, you know, it may have been me. Uh, I uh, I was reading another book uh, about an army guy. He described uh, two sets of Phantom flights that came in and supported him at Hamburger Hill. Yeah. I've been to Hamburger Hill a couple of times. You don't know till later because, you know, here's the hill, here's the yeah. controller, here's the mark, you hit it. Yeah. You find out later. That that's where you were. That was it. Yeah, okay. yeah. And you you mentioned that in the memoir. Well, Ms. Mr. Thorson, thank you very much for uh, for the memoir, and thank you for spending this time with us. I appreciate it. Well, it's a pleasure, Preston, and uh, we uh, we thank you very much. Thank you.